In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So as we continue celebrating Christ's resurrection on this third Sunday of Easter, I have a question for you. Do you believe in the resurrection? What does it even mean to believe in the resurrection? Now, I know that's a lot to lay on you first thing in the morning. And if you don't know how to answer, take heart. You are not alone. In fact, as our gospel readings in Easter season show us over and over again, even the first eyewitnesses to Christ's resurrection had trouble believing what they were seeing, even when he's standing right in front of them. This week, we hear from Luke about two of these disciples, Cleopas and maybe his wife, on the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus on the third day after Jesus' death. And they're talking about all that's happened in the last few days, all the horrible things that have happened to Jesus, his betrayal, condemnation, crucifixion, his death and burial. And then suddenly the risen Lord himself appears and falls into step with them but they don't recognize him. He talks to them. He actually asks them what they're discussing, and they go on to tell him all about himself and their dashed hopes in Jesus of Nazareth, but they still don't recognize him. Then they go on to tell him with some dismay that just this very morning, some women found his tomb empty, and others saw it too, but They don't know what this means, even though, remember, Jesus told them that he would die and be resurrected on the third day. He seems to grow a little bit impatient with their reluctance to believe and to see. And so he tries to help them out a little bit or a lot by interpreting all the scriptures had to say about him. But they still don't recognize him or understand. Evening falls, and as Jesus goes on to walk on by himself, they invite him to stay with them for the night. But that's right. They still don't recognize him. That is until at supper he takes bread, blesses, and breaks it and gives it to them. And suddenly they see And suddenly, they understand, they recognize all the clues that they missed along the way. Suddenly, they see what Jesus had been telling them, and they understand Scripture, and they see what was unfolding in their years with him. And once they see, everything changes, literally. Remember, they were on the road to Emmaus, but they turn around and race back to Jerusalem to tell the good news. It's a strange story, isn't it? Why on earth do these dear friends and disciples of his not recognize him? Why are they so slow of heart to believe the good news, the good news that they've been promised, that's been foretold to them in Scripture and by Jesus himself? Maybe it's because it doesn't make any sense according to what they know and what they've seen. Maybe because their sorrow and disappointment are so raw. Maybe because they sense the radical reorientation that his crucifixion would require of them. I don't know, but I do understand. I would have been slow to believe too, I think. I still am sometimes. Indeed, the resurrection is quite a stumbling block, isn't it? It was then and it is now. In fact, I think it's even more of a stumbling block than the crucifixion. The fact is, 
the resurrection completely defies everything we know about the laws of nature. We have no frame of reference for it, outside of perhaps The Walking Dead or Vampire Diaries, something you might find on TV. And because we have no frame of reference for it, because it can't be historically or scientifically verified, we modern people may be prone to dismiss it as deception, as fantasy, as allegory or symbol, anything but the truth, because we tend to define the truth so narrowly and unimaginatively. Plus, there is still pain, isn't there? and death and sorrow and all kinds of things that we might have hoped the resurrection would take away. My child still gets hurt. I still have friends languishing in prison or being attacked by cancer. My grandparents are still gone. How can the resurrection be true if all these things are true too? This last week, I saw a movie called Collateral Beauty. And it's a movie that's been haunting me this week, especially in light of Easter and the resurrection and our gospel reading. It's about this successful marketer named Howard, whose six-year-old daughter has died from a rare form of cancer. And in his grief, he has chosen a kind of living death that cost him his marriage, and it cost him his job. And after two years, two years of choosing to be numb to life and living this kind of living death, he starts to get scared that he's losing his mind. And so he finally steps into a grief group. And there he meets this woman. It's Hollywood, so she's a beautiful woman. And she tells him about a strange encounter she had when her daughter was dying of cancer. She says that she was sitting outside her daughter's hospital room as they were preparing her, and this woman, this strange woman, sits next to her and asks her, so who are you losing right now? And she tells her, my daughter, and the woman says, just this, be sure that you pay attention to the collateral beauty. Now, she has no idea what this woman meant. And she tells Howard that. She had no idea until later when she saw it for herself. She had this sensitivity, this sense of connection to this aliveness to both pain and beauty. And she tells Howard, it didn't undo what had been done. It didn't make it better. And it didn't make it okay but it was there also. Now, again, this is Hollywood, so you might expect our hero to grab hold of this glimmer of hope and pull himself out of the despair that he's been in. You might expect this to be the beginning of the happily ever after, but it's not. Because he rather scornfully dismisses what she says as sentimental fantasy or as a nice, but meaningless platitude. He is so afraid to hope again. He's so afraid that for him to live again would be to betray his daughter and his memory of her. But then one day he experiences it too. Out of nowhere, he suddenly becomes aware of all these things happening at once. Pain, beauty, Loss, love, death, life, belief, unbelief, time, eternity, all at once. And he realizes that this is it. This is what she was talking about, collateral beauty. It doesn't diminish or erase all that has been. It's just there also. Sadness disappointment, the reality of death, the memory of death, they linger long after Christ's resurrection too, don't they? These things are still real. 
They haven't been undone or reversed by the resurrection, but they have been changed. Life and beauty are entangled with death. Hope is woven into despair. Joy and sorrow, belief and unbelief, time and eternity exist side by side. This is no either or. It's a new reality that encompasses all of it and says that God is with us still in all of it. The same Christ who became human and loved his own to the end all the way to the cross. The same Christ who was crucified, died, and buried, that Christ is with us still, encountering us, calling us, transforming us, redeeming us. That, my friends, is the truth of the resurrection, at least as I understand it today, that Christ is with us still. And though this may not be historically or scientifically verifiable, many of us know it's true, don't we? We know it's true because we too have glimpsed Christ moving among us, renewing ourselves and the world. We know it's true because we too have known the hope and the peace and the new life that only he can give. We know it's true because we too have been met by the risen Christ in the breaking of bread, in scripture, in prayer, in a stranger, in the resurrection of hope. And so I ask you, do you believe in the resurrection? Do you believe, do you trust that Christ lives today and is among us and is being revealed still? Do you believe Do you trust in the living God? Amen.